Um, okay, hi everybody. Um, so this is a little bit of a special lecture, so I just want to give a little bit of an intro about it. Um, there are some people joining us on Zoom, not from Promise. Um, so hello, welcome to those people. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lee Mei Lim. I'm the executive director of Promise, and it's our pleasure to be hosting this year's AMS-sponsored Arnold Ross Lecture. Um, so the Arnold Ross Lecture really started in the late 80s. Um, Professor Paul Sally at the University of Chicago encouraged the AMS to sponsor a series of a lecture series that's aimed at high school students. Um, and in 1993, the series was dedicated to Arnold Ross, who um, people at Promise and people, if there are people joining us from the Ross program, I don't, I, I'm not sure, um, will know that Arnold was known for starting the Ross program, which continues to this day. Um, so, and our speaker today is Jordan Ellenberg from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, where Jordan is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Mathematics. Um, Jordan is a fellow of the AMS. He's the um, author of best-selling books like How Not to Be Wrong and Shape. Um, Jordan, besides being known for his work in number theory, is known as a really wonderful communicator of mathematics. And so we're really lucky to have him here um, for this talk. Um, and he is going to tell us about the CAP problem and hypothesis gener generation by machine. Don't clap yet. I didn't do anything yet. Okay. No. Uh, great to see you guys. Thank you so much uh, for coming. And I'm just, it warms my heart to see sort of so many people uh, spending their summer uh, learning about number theory and, and, and doing some math. Um, and so I kind of want to talk about a problem that I've been thinking about in one way or another for quite a long time, probably more than 20 years. And um, uh, you know, there's a question of how I want to describe this problem. So let me ask the following question. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with the card game called Set? Does that still have any cultural currency? Oh, okay. Well, that answers that question. I, that, I you know, yeah, you, you never know. I can't mention like asteroids anymore, which I used to, or like, I mean, okay, one kid likes asteroids. I'm happy about that. Okay. Um, Okay, well, two people said, I am going to mention asteroids in this talk then. Okay, you'll see, you'll see when. Um, okay, so let me remind you, for the people who didn't raise their hand, which was a, a minority but a substantial one, let me sort of tell, either tell you or remind you uh, how this game works. So, um, so set is a game with... 81 cards, a number of serious number theoretic import, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, and each card uh, has four what I will call attributes. Um, it has a color, a shading, a number and a shape. And I will tell you now like what those things are. Let's see, so the colors are red, green, and purple. I do, Lima was good enough to give me some colored chalk, so we'll see if I end up using it. Um, the shadings are, um, let me sort of use the, are empty, uh, striped, or, filled. Um, the number is um, this little this little shape. Oh, by the way, maybe I'll do shape next. The shape can be um, an oval. It can be a diamond. Or it can be this shape that players of this game don't have like a well-defined name for it. I call it the squiggle. Some people call it the peanut. Um, but it is whatever it is. It's like this kind of shape. Um, and then the number, there can be either three one or two. And I know I wrote these numbers in sort of a weird order, but there's a reason for that too. Um, 
So already there's kind of a combinatorics problem at the beginning of this game, although I already kind of answered it. Um, for each combination of the attributes, there's exactly one card, and each of the attributes can take on three values. And so that's why the total number of cards is three times three times three times three, or 81, a handsome prime power. Um, and what's kind of cool about this game is that it only has one rule, which I will now tell you. Um, so three cards. form uh, a set. And now we already have a problem because as mathematicians, right, we sort of, the word set means something to us. We're like, well, any three cards form a set, right, in the sense that we mean it. So um, let me say three cards form a set in the sense of the trademark of this card game. Uh, if, and now this is a bit of a mouthful, um, if, uh, with respect to each attribute, they are either all the same or all different. And not, in other words, you're not allowed to have two of one and one of the other. If two of the cards are red, then the third one has to be red. It can't be a different color. If two of the cards are squiggles, then the third one also has to be a squiggle. Whereas if one of the cards is a squiggle and the other one is an oval, then the third one had better be a diamond. It has no other choice uh, what to be. Um, so, And the way this game is, I mean, I sort of said there's only one rule, but that's not like a rule, that's a definition. So the, the way this game is played is, is that you lay out cards on the table, and whenever you see three cards that form a set, you sort of yell set, and you sort of grab the cards, and then you try to be as good as this as possible, so that in the end, you've seized the most sets. So it's a game of recognizing when three cards form a set TM as quickly as you can. And sort of the miracle of this game is that this cumbersome looking definition is actually, as you know if you've played it, quite easy to learn. It fits quite nicely in the mind. And you can actually get quite good at it. Um, and as I'll argue in a minute, I think the reason for that is that this rule, which expressed this way in English, like looks like kind of a mess, is actually mathematically extremely elegant and natural. Um, and maybe one way to see that already um, is to make the following observation that I think most players of this game uh, sort of come to intuitively rather quickly. Well, maybe it's maybe the easiest way to do this is to actually draw a little picture. Oh, now I'm going to use my colored chalk. Okay, this is a good time to use it. Um, so let's say I have um, a card which is one red oval and a card, which I'm kind of making this up as I go, which is uh, three striped diamonds and both are red. And you can imagine that I may wonder, well, oh, is that a bad idea? Oh, is it gonna just like scroll up by itself? Well, let me draw it again over here. I don't wanna make you do that. Too late, I've redone it. I've already, I'm already most of the way through redoing it over here. And so you may be on the lookout for another card that would complete this set, that together with these two cards would form a set. And in fact, there's only one. There's a unique one. Um, I, I sort of already gestured at this by sort of talking you through how this definition works. Um, after all, these two cards are red. So with respect to color, the third card in any set can't be any color different from red. It has to be red again. I already have this chalk out. Um, on the other hand, the two numbers are different. It's one and three. So the third number has to be, they all three have to be different. So the third number has to be two. Um, as for shape, also different, right? An oval and a diamond. So um, the third one has to be different, different from these two. It has to be squiggle. So I already know I need to have two squiggles. And then because these two fill patterns are also different, um, they're empty and, and striped, all three fill patterns has to be different. So... Uh, so this has to be filled in. So um, 
the sort of first theorem of set is that um, any two cards are contained in a unique set. There's like w exactly one card that completes it. And actually, uh, it's a it's an immediate corollary of that theorem that um, any two sets, TM, have at most one card in common. Well, I, I hope I, I've written those statements in a way to try to make them look somewhat familiar. What, what do they look like? They look like something you know? Yes, asteroid sky. Yeah, these are the rules for points and lines, right? These are familiar statements from, uh, from geometry. Uh, we know that any two points are contained in a unique line, and any two lines have at most one point in common. I should have said any two different lines. Nobody hassled me about the... Uh, about this edge case. Um, so that's good. That solves our uh, notational problem. Uh, because instead of cards, we can say points. And instead of sets, we can say line. Now, this is a little bit of a bold move by me, but I think there's sort of a fundamental principle in mathematics, right, that we sort of start with some notion of points and lines that come from good old-fashioned Euclidean geometry, but it's a very common move, just like, okay, I'll give you an example, like, just like when you learn about complex numbers, right, you sort of learn about the square root of negative one, and at first, there's this kind of this philosophical question, like, like, is that a number? It's not on the number line, it's like, maybe it's like some other kind of thing that's not a number at all, but eventually, you kind of get used to it, right, and you're like, well, I can treat it like a number, you can do the things with it that you do to numbers, like add it and multiply it to stuff, and it kind of behaves the way we expect numbers to behave. And eventually you're just like, okay, I guess if it behaves like a number, it's a number. Well, geometry is like that too. I think we sort of have come to a point in the development of the subject where we say like, okay, if things behave the way points and lines behave them, behave, it's okay to call them points and lines. So indeed, um, the, the, the cards of set form a kind of finite geometry in which the sets are the lines and the, uh, and the cards are the points. But actually, because we're all number theorists here, right? Right, yes? OK. Um, I, let, let me make that a little bit more than a metaphor. And let me sort of uh, say that a little more uh, clearly, because um, the way I think most of us nowadays think about this game is we kind of um, give numerical value to each of these attributes. So I'm going to write 0, 1, and 2. This is kind of a good way to encode the card, so I don't have to kind of write, draw these little pictures each time, much as I like drawing them. Um, so I guess this red, let's, 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 let's do this. I, I, I somehow make the mistake of instead of having this in my notes, I make up the cards each time, so I, we actually have to like work it out as we go, but that's good. We can make sure that we got it right. Uh, so let's see. This is red, so it's 0. It's an oval, also 0. There's one of them, so it's 1. And um, oh, sorry, it's empty, so it's a zero, but, and then it's an oval, so it's zero. Okay, and this one is um, a red striped three, um, and it's a diamond, so that's two. Great, okay, so now what's what's this one? It's, um, great, okay. So this is a very efficient encoding that keeps me having from having to write these things down. Um, but now, let me show you sort of arithmetically how this works. Instead of writing them like this, I'm going to write um, and then um, here's my three cards. Uh, and then I'm just going to add them up. But I'm not going to add them up just as integers. Um, in fact, these 0, 1, and 2 um, are not 
the regular old integers that you know these are in z mod 3z, the integers modulo 3. So that's really how my labeling works. So these are, and now this sort of reveals why I wrote these numbers in a weird order because I'm in z mod 3z. So 3 is just another name for 0. Um, so in fact, the numbers exactly match. This is 0, this is 1, and this is 2. And now we can add. Let's do it. Um, 0 plus 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 plus 2 is 1 plus 2 is 3, and that's also 0. And now, actually, the others, they're all 0 plus 1 plus 2. So these three cards add to 0. And in fact, this is the rule. This strange-sounding rule that defines this game is actually extremely natural from the point of view of arithmetic. It just says, when I add up the three cards, they add up to 0. So let's write this again. Um, Well, I think I don't need now. I don't need this anymore because we're we're about to dump the entire card game concept, and uh, so now I'll say I'll replace the rule and say um, three elements x y z of so instead of calling it. The set deck, I'm going to call it z mod 3z to the fourth, the set of four tuples of elements of z mod 3z. Um, they form a set if x plus y plus z equals zero. Or here I mean like the zero vector, right? The sort of uh, the, the, the four tuple whose elements are all zero. Um, and in my opinion, this is why this game is easy to learn, because somehow it has sort of some structure that mathematically is extremely elegant and natural. But wait, there's something I didn't do yet. Um, I was supposed to tell you how I was going to justify this claim that we were talking about points and lines. Well, we kind of agree that vectors are points, right? That's how we, how we uh, render, like a point in high dimensional space, in this case, four dimensional space. But what about lines? Like x plus y plus z equals zero it doesn't really look like a condition that forces three vectors to be collinear. But let me put it a different way. Um, so we could also say, this is saying like y equals negative uh, x plus z. That's just, a re that's just a rephrasing of this. Um, But that's the same thing as saying y equals 1 half x plus z. And then you're like, what? But remember, I'm working modulo 3. So 2 is the same number as negative 1. And I think we all agree that 1 over negative 1 is negative 1. So I guess modulo 3, this is a completely valid statement. But what does this say in geometry? It says that y is the midpoint between x and z. And I hope you'll all agree that the midpoint between two points is on the line joining those two points. So I got to tell you guys, mod 3 geometry is a little bit weird, because you might have noticed that the argument I just made, there was nothing special about y. I mean, I just like pulled it out. I chose y to pull out. I could have put, pulled out x or z instead. So one difference between the geometry modulo 3 and the geometry you guys know very well from the real numbers is that um, when three cards form a set, I'm telling you that y is the midpoint between x and z. But it's also the case that z is the midpoint between x and y and x is the midpoint between y and z. So that's, that's a little bit different <laughs> from the geometry you're used to. Maybe I like to sort of draw a little picture like this. You can sort of think of x, y, and z as like being points on a circle that are evenly arrayed. And then you kind of see how like each one is like the midpoint between the other two. I think that's the mental picture to have. OK, so all this description, and I've not yet told you what the problem is that we're actually going to talk about today. So now, so now I can tell you a question uh, that I think most players of this game uh, encounter. You know, you're playing the game, and the more, as you can imagine, right, the more cards that are laid out in front of you, the more you feel like there's got to be a set there if I look hard enough. The tension mounts, right, as you sort of try to be the first person uh, to see it. Um, and the more and more cards are out, and you feel more and more like, there's, I haven't found it, but there's got to be one out there. There's got to be one there. Um, so the natural question is, when is that actually true? When is it not just a feeling? How many cards have to be out before you actually know that three of them form a set? So let's, um, 
So let's write that as a question. Well, rather than phrase it as there must be a set, let me phrase it in terms of there might not be. So what is the maximal number um, M such that there exists a collection of M cards with no set. And this is this is not such an easy question. If you actually play set a lot, you'll see that usually once you have like, let's say 15 or so cards, like it's extremely rare for there not to be a set, but it is actually possible. And so let me say a little bit about how as mathematicians we think about a problem like this. Um, because I think it has sort of good guides for other problems that you guys uh, may work on. Um, so maybe a comment here. One thing you might do is say like, well, I guess maybe what I would do is just like take, um, is take all the sets of M cards and check them to see like which ones have a set in them. Um, but that's kind of a bad idea. Like, how, how many how many subsets are there of the eighty one cards? Do we do combinatorics in this program, or do we do are we pure hardcore number theorists who never do combinatorics? Somebody, somebody, tell me how many subsets there are of uh, out of out of eighty one cards. Two to the eighty one, and is that would you say that's a big number or a small number? It's pretty big, right? Would you like? Would your laptop be able to check them all? Definitely no. Two to the eighty one is too big, too big to exhaustively search. Um, so you got to somehow be a little more intelligent than just searching this exhaustively. Um, and so when we're faced with a problem like this, that's maybe just like too big to instantly do, a thing that we do as number theorists is like, let's make the problem much smaller. Let's make it easier and see if we can solve it then. And there's a natural way to do this because really everything I told you would make sense in some kind of different commercial world where the people who invented set had had a different number of attributes from four, right? You could imagine them having made a deck of 243 cards where there was five attributes, that would be kind of like a handful. And then the problem would be even harder. Or you could imagine them having made a deck with, many, with fewer attributes and thus many fewer cards, making our problem easier and probably making the game less fun. So for instance, I imagine some world in which the extremely uncommercial makers of this game had decided that there should be just one attribute and they were trying to sell people a deck with only three cards in it. I mean, that probably wouldn't really be a big seller, but you could imagine it. Um, maybe it would look like this. Okay, so all one color. Okay, so in this game, how many cards can you have on the table before there's a set? Yeah, two, right? This is, I mean, basically any two, I mean, obviously you need three cards to form a set. Any two cards don't do it, but once you have all three, those evidently form a set. The, the, in this case, the numbers are all different and everything else is the same because in this very minuscule puny version of this game, um, there is only one color and there is only one shape and there is only one fill pattern. All right, so maybe that was too easy. Um, but now let's do the case, um, where there's two attributes. So I can just draw this by let's um let's keep all the fill patterns empty, but now let's say the attributes are just number and shape. And then I get to draw my squiggles. So now there's nine cards. And the question of this is. How many of these cards could we have out and not have there be any set? So actually, for this, this is a good moment because I've been talking for a while. Let's take like three minutes 
and actually try to do this. If you have paper, you can. You can do it with your mind if you're good at holding things in your head. I am not. I need paper. Um, and let's actually see how how many cards we can get out of these without making a set. And then we'll and then we'll reconvene and see how we did. I'm missing some squiggles. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. You're totally right. And I love drawing them so much. It's sort of funny that I did that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, you know, we have 26 seconds left, but I feel like there's always like a moment where it kind of quiets and I feel like people are ready to reconvene. So let me stop the, the, the timer. It didn't take the full three minutes and like ask how many, uh, how many did we get? You can just yell it out. I want to hear the range. Wow. No, no, nobody got six. You guys are good number theorists. Um, yeah, so four. So tell me, tell me where to, tell me where to put them. Four is the right answer. Tell me where should where should I put them? Okay, person in the back. I could do the four in the top left corner. That's what is that? Do other people do it in a different way? What else do people What else do people do? Yeah, bottom left corner would be the same, right? I mean, I could. Uh, in fact, let me uh, let me actually label these. Oh, I I better label them the right way. One, two, zero. And then, uh, oh. OK, I forgot how I labeled them. What did I do was oval, zero, and I don't remember. Let's hope it was like this. Um, so I could do the uh, I could do the top left corner. I could do the bottom left corner. Um, I like the bottom left corner because it one way of thinking of it is like um, those four guys are um, one, one. One, two, two, one, and two, two. Um, so they're like the cards that I get if I actually forget that one of the possible values of each attribute exists. I never use the zero. I only use the ones and the twos. Um, and in fact, then it's kind of easy to see that you can't have a set because um, any, let, let's say I have three cards that made a set. Well, I only have one and two to use. So they can't all be different. So they must be all the same. 
But if for each attribute, the cards are all the same, then the cards themselves are like literally the same. So this shows you that, um, so four is indeed, well, okay, I didn't show you that four is the most you can do, but you can kind of satisfy yourself of that. And I'll bet most of you did, even in the time that you were just thinking about it. Certainly, certainly if you start with these four, you can easily check that you can't add any more. But that's not a proof, right? You need to show there's not some other way you can get five in there. But I promise you cannot. Yeah. Okay. I think it doesn't, but let's find the set. Let's find, okay. Now we're going to play in real time. Two-dimensional set. Who can find one? I'm not going to do it. I need somebody else to do it. Uh, okay. Long-haired guy in the back there. Uh, I don't see any other long-haired guys in the back. Um, oh, yeah, look at that. Right? All three the first coordinates are different. All three second coordinates are different. So those three sum to zero. Yeah, so l l let's draw it. It's like, uh, well, okay, we, we can add it up and see that. So, so yeah, it, it turns out, I mean, you got to actually check this, but it turns out that any five cards you write down, you will find three of them that sum to zero. Whereas four, you actually can find a configuration that doesn't, that, uh, that doesn't allow for any set. And indeed, this already makes it clear that in the regular old card game with four attributes, already we learn something. Like already we see, oh, so we can definitely get a li at least 16 cards if each attribute is only allowed to take two of the values. The same trick works. So let's actually sort of formalize this a little bit. Yeah. Um, yes, because there's no five. Because there's no way to make five cards that have no set. So if you have four that don't have a set, than any one that I add. So, um, so I tried to be careful to say the maximal number m. So what Jared is alluding to is it's possible that I could sort of find some smaller collection of cards, which is maximal in the sense that I could not add any card to it, but that's different from being maximal inside. So I'm trying to like use my words carefully, but absolutely. Okay. Um, so let's make a definition. Let's just write So f of n is the maximal size of a subset of z mod 3z to the n. Um, in which no three distinct elements sum to zero. So what we know so far is that I guess f of one is two and f of two is four. And we've sort of shown an inequality that f of n is at least as big as two to the n. And this, this is, I think, about what I knew when I first started ever thinking about this problem after playing set um, probably in like maybe 1999 or 2000. Um, in, in fact, what happened is I was playing this game with like an eight-year-old and he was much better than me and I found it very frustrating. So I'm like, I gotta be able to do something about this game that's better than this eight-year-old. I gotta prove a theorem of some kind. That this kid can't do, I hope. Um, and so that's when I started thinking about this and I was sort of set out to prove that this, um, that, this, that this lower bound was actually correct. The two to the end was the best you can do. Because indeed you can sort of satisfy, I mean, if you actually sort of like lay out 16 cards, you almost always are going to find a set. It's already very hard, unless you know what to do, to find the 16 that don't. Um, so I set out to prove that uh, f of n was actually equal to 2 to the n. And it was a little bit, and I couldn't do it, and it hurt my self-esteem. Uh, but then I found out that that was just like not true. So I felt much better. Right, because so, so if you're trying to prove something and you can't do it, you feel very bad. But then if it's not true, it's like, oh, it's good that I couldn't prove it. It would have been much worse if I did have a proof of it. So 
And in fact, not only is it wrong, it's wrong at the very next step. So this is your lesson, like never do induction with only two cases. Um, because already f of three is equal to nine. You can do a little bit better. Um, I'll, draw, I'll draw a little picture because it's fun. Um, so you can sort of think of these three grids. And if you draw, this is kind of a four point configuration like the one that we already saw. And here's another one. And if you choose just the right two, you have room for one more little guy uh, in the middle. And indeed, I'm, I'm going to sort of tell you some answers. The answer to the original question uh, is actually 20. There is a way to, to put down 20 cards. And you know, it's actually kind of hard to find this, but uh, but you but you can do it. Um, so then the question becomes, if you're a mathematician, well, can I compute this function for any n? Can you find a general formula? It's not obvious what it's supposed to be, right? 2, 4, 9, 20 is not like a sequence that you know. Um, and, um, and then you learn that this question is actually kind of an old one with a bit of a history. Um, and I'm going to, because I, I, really, I do want to talk about machine learning, like I'm going to a little bit abbreviate my discussion. If I were giving a talk about this, you know, in 2010, as I have done, like I sort of would have said about what I told you and then like, like wow, this is like a pretty hard problem. Like we don't know very much, um, but we know a lot more now. So let me sort of tell you a little bit, um, which is, so I'm trying to think what order to say things in. Okay. so. So for lower bounds, um, you can get something like about 2.218 to the n. Um, and for an upper bound, I think this is due to Adel from about 2002, if I remember correctly. Um, for upper bounds, well, OK, there's an obvious upper bound that there's a 3 to the n, because that's how many cards there are. And actually, it was like a long time before people could even do appreciably better than that. And so there was a wonderful theorem of Mishulam that this was at most 1 over n times 3 to the n. Um, or maybe it was 2 over n, if I remember right. This is Mishulam from uh, 1995. And it was a big open question. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, but not like a particularly meaningful one. So basically, if you have an example, you can kind of raise it to product. So any sort of large example gives you a lower bound. And sort of that's where it comes from. It comes from some example that Adel cooked up. Um, so a big question was whether this exponent could be improved. And in fact, like in 2017, uh, my colleague Dion Kleiswhite and I proved a bound like this. Um, so again, if I were talking about this problem around then, then I would have talked about this and sort of said something about how we proved it. But I'm totally not going to talk about that because I want to talk about new stuff. Um, but I want to emphasize that this is still like a really huge gap, right? Between 2.2 .2 to the n and 2.756 to the n. Like if n is like 10 or something, that's already like a titanic difference between the lower bound and the upper bound. And one of the interesting things about this problem is that, as you probably know, in number theory is full of conjectures. There's a lot more that we don't know than that we know. But when I say conjecture, it means that there's kind of a consensus among mathematicians as to what the answer is supposed to be. Even if we can't prove it, we know what we're trying to prove. We know what we believe in our hearts is true. Okay, with this problem, it's quite different. I don't think there's any consensus. I don't think people know what to believe, whether the truth about this function f of n is, does it grow more like this or does it grow more like this? I, I don't think people know. And indeed, when all we knew was this and this, I think people didn't know whether it grew with any exponent smaller than, sorry, any base of an exponent smaller than three. People didn't know whether to expect whether a theorem like this was true. This turned out to be true, but there's still this huge gap. So for the last part of the talk, um, let me talk a little bit about machine learning, which is something that I think uh, 
is a subject of great interest these days. I mean, and it's interest of all kinds of reasons, but I have a very parochial interest. I want to talk about sort of what machine learning has to offer pure mathematics, the stuff that we do. Um, so, So what does machine learning have to offer in generating large subsets of Z mod 3Z to the N? with no lines and you can reflect on your own process that we just did, right? You were doing this in the case N equals two and you were sort of trying to like lay down cards in a way maybe you were like looking to see if you could like avoid a set by doing it. Um, I, there's lots of ways you can imagine approaching this problem. And actually let, let me ask, I'm curious, like how many of you guys, I don't know if you guys are coders or like what you like to do. How many of you guys have ever done any kind of machine learning experiment, like downloaded PyTorch or something like that, or any of the packages. Um, okay, some, but not all. In fact, not even that many. And how many of you guys have used any kind of like large language model, like whether it's Claude or ChatGPT or like any of the uh, um, of these things? Have you, have you asked it a math question? How did it do? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So here's what does not work. You can't open up your chat GPT window and say, what is the largest subset of Z mod 3Z to the eighth that contains no three collinear point? I promise you that will not work. Or, oh, I don't know. We put, we posted our paper in December, so maybe now it'll work, but only because we wrote about it in our paper. I mean, um, it doesn't, I, I mean, it won't actually do that. So let me explain uh, this procedure that, uh, the folks I worked with at Google DeepMind came up with, which I think is quite inventive and which um, really circumvents some of the serious limitations that LLMs have. Like, well, what are those? I mean, you guys said you asked it uh, math questions and I got a little like, from you guys. So like, what was, what went wrong? What was bad? Yeah. Anybody, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, what did what did you see? It only goes to case language, so it has no notion of logic. So it can't actually construct a proof. Yes, oh that is a controversial statement and people argue about this point, but like it's 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 certainly not clear that it does have any conception of logic. Yeah, so I mean yeah, so the, so the question is, how could we actually use a system? Because there's lots and lots of work on applications of machine learning to pure mathematics. Most of it does not involve large language models, but this one actually does. And so it's a very interesting question. How could we actually leverage this new uh, machine learning architecture in a way that does not fall prey to the pitfalls that you guys have all seen, which is, uh, in your case, lack of an underlying logical structure, in your case, making shit up, that's the technical term. I mean, that's, I mean, that, so we, we don't want it to do that, right? So, um, okay, interesting. So, so right, we're saying that that's sort of saying something that sort of superficially looks like the thing you're trying to get, but isn't because it doesn't know the difference. Okay, so let me explain this very inventive protocol. Um, that they used, um, which is the following. So this is a this is a protocol they developed called Fun Search that I worked on them with. Um, um, and the idea is to search the space of short Python programs. whose output is a subset of Z mod 3Z 
to the end. Um, this is a kind of a weird thing to do, right? Like where, where would you get such a program? And let me emphasize that, let, let, let's fix an N. I really want to sort of show you like what we actually did here. Let, let's take eight. I want to take some fixed number. How are we going to do this? Well, I'm going to make now on this board like a little cartoon of how this protocol works. So first, you start with this big cloud is like a million Python programs that output subsets of Z mod 3Z to the eighth. Where do you get them? Well, maybe you just like make them randomly. I mean, you can't just like have a random string of words and try to run it in Python, it won't run. Um, but you sort of build a skeleton so that the, the, the code is forced to output a subset of, vect of, of eight tuples of elements of Z mod 3Z. But you initialize it like pretty randomly. So like literally you make a million random programs. And you will not be surprised to hear that most of them do not give you a subset that satisfies the goal we're trying to get, which is the no three elements sum to zero. Probably some of them will. And the ones that will, probably most of them won't be very big. But that's OK. We have like a million to work with. So we've got a lot of chances. Um, and then maybe you say, um, let's say take the top 100 performers out of that million. And so maybe, maybe out of a million, maybe you have 100 that generates something of use. Maybe not very big, but maybe it generates like some set of vectors that actually has no three uh, forming a line. Or if even that's too much to ask, maybe you sort of privilege the ones that have the fewest set of three forming a line. Well, whatever, you sort of pick out your favorite 100 out of that million. Um, and now we have 100 programs. And now we just say LLM more like these. Right, so that's the prompt you give it. You give it these programs and say like, oh, these are the programs I like, give me more like these. So it's kind of cool. So let me emphasize that we are, the AI part is all here, it's not here. This part has no AI in it at all. This part, we're just like running all 1 million of these programs and for each one assessing, uh, did the subset it produced actually have no three forming a line? That's just like a completely deterministic non-AI thing that you can check almost instantly. And how many elements were in it? And if it had a lot of elements, that's good. And if it satisfies the condition that no three are in a line, then that's also good. And it sort of passed the test. All the AI part is here. And maybe a lot of these things, right, as you've seen, maybe no underlying logical structure. Maybe a lot of the stuff it produces is not a Python program that runs at all. Maybe it's a program that runs, but gives you like a very bad example. Maybe it gives you some, a set which has like lots of lines in it. Um, but that's OK, because all the failures and all the stuff it makes up and all the time it just straight out lies to you, that will all be sieved out in this step. And then you just basically do this for like a long, long time. Um, <laughs> And what I find rather surprising is that this basically works. And, and I did not think it was going to. So, um, so again, this procedure kind of exactly plays to the strengths of the LLM, which is that it's pretty fast and it can generate lots of stuff, as you've probably seen. And it exactly accounts for the weaknesses of the LLM, which is that any hallucinations that the LLM produces um, are just thrown out in the trash and you keep only the good stuff and sort of iterate this and sort of try to make it better and better at producing programs uh, that are doing the actual job. Um, and so, you know, we're, all, we're almost at the end. So let me just sort of say a couple of thoughts about this, what I think is exciting about it and where I think it's limited. I, I mean, one thing that's exciting and you can see some of the code in the paper if you want, is it's pretty neat to look at this code that was generated by the machine, because you do 
kind of feel like it's trying to do something? That's probably an illusion, right? It's like a philosophy question, not a math question, whether it's it can be said to be trying to do something. But to me, as a mathematician, it doesn't matter whether it's an illusion or not. If I can get an idea from looking at the program, it doesn't matter to me this philosophical question about whether the program had the idea or the LLM had the idea. All that matters is that after looking at it, I have the idea. And as mathematicians, right, we're trying to get ideas. So any mechanical way to help us have ideas, to me, is very valuable. Um, but I also want to be honest about the limitations of this approach. What would be really amazing, right? I told you we run this for a long time, generating subsets of Z mod 3Z to the eighth. And it does eventually get good at producing examples on Z mod 3Z to the eighth. And in this case, it actually even found one that was bigger than any that was known. The biggest that was known had size 496. And we were able to find a program that generated a set of five, size 512. So not a lot bigger, but a little bit bigger on a problem that's been around for a long time. Now, here's the dream. The dream would be, OK, I made this program that was really good at making a large example. Now let me go to the beginning of the program where it says n equals 8 and change it to like n equals 9 or n equals 10 and see how it does. You know how it does? Terrible. Really bad. So I got to be honest with you. The dream would be, oh, this thing will come up with a program that actually gives good results for general n. I didn't think that was going to happen. It indeed did not happen at all. So this is what's called in machine learning, the generalization problem. Can it learn beyond what you're training it on? And as of now, so far, I would say no. Um, what the dream is, and it hasn't happened quite yet in this problem, but I think there's like a lot, I, I, we've seen things like that happen in other problems, is something intermediate. Um, that the program maybe doesn't give you code that actually works for all n, but it does something interesting enough for the specific n that you trained it on that it gives you ideas for what to do and helps the human prove a new theorem for general n. Um, and that's happened in DeepMind's work with sort of some other problems. And here, um, it, it, it's still ongoing. And I think there's some hope that that hasn't happened yet. So I think because we're almost at five, uh, let me stop there and take questions. And thank you guys so much for spending the afternoon with me and talking about this. Um, yes, in the middle. Yeah, that's a great question. We did try that. So you can try training. You can try sort of saying, actually, I'm going to sort of mix it up and ask you to sort of be good at several different dimensions. And so far, what happens is, um, you can get it to work pretty well on exactly the set of dimensions you trained it on, but then it falls off outside of that. So that, that is a good idea, or at least I thought it was a good idea, but it didn't work, at least, at least in the trials that, that we've done. Uh, yes, in back of glasses. Yeah, so in this project, we didn't because we wanted to sort of focus on one problem. So there's a whole, I mean, if you like this kind of number theory, there's a whole rich world of problems of this kind. And um, just to say one word about it, the reason we do three, I didn't, yeah, I guess I didn't really emphasize why three. It's not because there's like a card game people like to play. Um, it's because two is too simple. And if you try to formulate the problem mod two, it's like hard to formulate a good problem that's interesting. Um, and once you do a prime bigger than three, there's actually a bunch of different problems that you could study, which all come to become the same thing, mod three. So for instance, um, mod three, a line only has three points. So saying your set contains a line is the same thing as saying it has three collinear points. But when the prime is larger, you can say, well, maybe I want a set that has no three collinear points. Or maybe I, I, I want a set such that you never have a solution to x plus y plus z equals 0. Or maybe I want a set that doesn't contain any full line, which would have p points. So all of those questions are different. All of them would, I think, be amenable to this kind of protocol. But I, I don't know. These are like guys. These are like highly paid people who have a certain amount of their time. So you sort of focus on this one problem. It's, it's called by various people. Some people call it additive number theory. Some people call it additive combinatorics. I guess the combinatorists call it additive combinatorics and the number theorists call it additive number theory. Um, but yeah, so it's a wonderful subject and that's very, very 
active. Uh, yeah. Something that's so bizarre to me about this is the choice of using Python. Like you're using a programming language, like, and then you're making machines write in a program. Very strange. Let me explain why I think that's a really good idea. And it's exactly because to me, the goal is not necessarily to like get the biggest solution. The goal is for me to have a new idea about the problem. So for me to have a new idea about the problem, whatever it's doing had better be expressed in a language that I, a person can read and interpret. So in terms of sort of keywords of machine learning, we talked about generalizability, that's a keyword, but another huge one is interpretability. And I think that this is an interpret interpretability play. That's why we're doing it in Python, because we want to get stuff that a human can look at and be like, oh, I see what it's trying to do. And indeed, if any of you have ever played with neural networks, uh, yeah, you can sort of generate some incredibly complicated function that maybe does the task, but then a human can't look at it. Or you would just look at it and you're like, okay, I see sort of some thing I, don't, I can't make head nor tail of. And we as people can't get ideas from that. So it's not useful for my purposes. Uh, yeah. I also heard this part of like the context in the, in the LLM. Like, does it know about the program? Uh, in every iteration, does it know about the program to get the worst conditions? Does it no, absolutely not. Okay. It doesn't It doesn't see them again. That's what? It doesn't see them again, no. Okay. That seems to me like something that you should have. But like, I'm, I'm imagining, like, that you replace the LLM with, a building full of a thousand voters or something, and you just keep the same uh, workflow. I I feel like they would want to know not just oh these are the hundred programs we wrote that are working, but also like oh these are the ones we wrote last time that didn't work. And I guess it needs to remember what they wrote because. So I'll say this like in, 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 there so there are, are there are protocols that are more like that where you're like. Okay, here's the successes and here's the failures. Give me stuff that's like the successes, but unlike the failures. Um, I would say actually in another experiment I'm working on, we sort of tried some stuff like that and it totally didn't work. I think one, I think one reason for that is I think give me something like this is a much easier problem than give me something unlike this. So it's not clear. I don't know if you, in fact, going back to an earlier iteration, there was a thing called word to vec which was like, I'm gonna express a word as a vector in 300 dimensional space that captures something of its meaning. And you could really do some stuff like, okay, if the vectors are close together, the words are close together. But here's a very basic linguistic task that people are good at that this totally could not do, which is like, what's the opposite of this word? Totally failed on that. It was very good at like, what's a synonym for this word? So for whatever reason, I think these things are, are I mean, you know, give me something that's like maximally unlike this other thing. It's actually kind of, it's not even clear what I would mean by that. But in any event, it doesn't seem to be a task that LLMs at the moment are good at. Um, okay, I'm gonna, call you, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll call you again, yeah. I want to add to that, that I think part of the problem is that like it could be that one of the programs fails for a very dumb reason. And if, so if one of the programs that's very similar succeeds and then the other fails for a dumb reason, then the, that could lead to going that whole idea. Like it's a yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's lots of crap like that. And like, I guess I'll say this. Maybe another good thing to say is that this is part of like an entire genre that is older than machine learning called genetic algorithms that are sort of meant to kind of imitate this process of like selection. That's one way of thinking what this top arrow is doing, right? So when like the way selection works is like as a species develops, it's not like remembering all the extinct species and be like, oh, definitely like don't try to be like that guy who went extinct like 10 million years ago, right? You don't remember those guys. You just know who your parents are. Okay, they're alive, so they must have done something right. And you sort of try to be like them genetically, maybe with sort of some small modification. So I think, I mean, these are called genetic algorithms and they're supposed to imitate that process. And I think that's one reason why historically this is the way they're, they're built and they have a pretty long record of success. So this is like genetic algorithm plus the LLM step, which is what's new. Yeah. One 
you, you totally could. You totally could. Right. So you could imagine, well, what if I'm going to be flexible and make sort of some uh, and make some trade-off where maybe I can get a lot bigger if I allow sort of some very small set of lines. And in fact, sometimes there are times when you can actually get better results. Like if you want to sort of find a perfect solution, like something with no lines, sometimes you actually do much better by saying, search for something with very few lines and then manually stripping them out. And you actually do better than if you'd searched for no lines in the first place. We didn't, we didn't try that for this protocol. But yeah. Oh, thank you. Me too. Mm -hmm. No, I was, I, especially like what you said about durability. Like, I just want to have all these matches. Like, I do bring my actions because there's like a lot in natural engineering where, like, when you just put your blood, you build an indication of what was in the blood. And if not going through that process or if that's seen to some point by the agent, which is like, Lots of intuition. What's your imagination for the agent that's going to be able to? Um, I think that's a realistic worry, but I also think that um, you know, the past is the best predictor of the future. And there's a very long tradition of technology assisting mathematicians in doing stuff, right? So like when I started in math, it was like the dawn of computer algebra systems. They basically didn't exist. Now it's like very easy to like do things like manipulate like polynomials, like polynomials over finite fields, like all this kind of number theoretic stuff we like um, on a computer. And I don't feel like human mathematicians have less of a feel for things than they did before. So I would tend to say this, I, I think that there are people who present this kind of tech as like a complete discontinuity from what came before. And that's certainly possible, but I don't really see that much evidence that that's the case. Having really gotten into it and worked with it, it feels more like a continuation of the kind of development that's existed in mathematics for like a hundred years already. And I don't, you know, I don't think we're worse than like, I don't think we're worse at math than like the mathematicians of the 18th century who had to work every, every single thing out by hand. I was going to say like worse than Gauss, but like we probably are worse than Gauss to be fair, but like the other people. <laughs> All right. So maybe we're sort of a little over time. So maybe we should let people clear out, but I'll hang out here if people want to ask more questions. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>